Greetings, lovely, lovely tubidors. It's been a long old day, and this has been a sod of a video to make. Some of you will remember the last video I made about these two guys, Mr. Rex Bay and R. Wayne Steiger. This is supposed to be part two. Um, it was originally entitled Missing Time because uh, Mr. Steiger has a theory about an event that happened, uh, I believe sometime in November 2018, and apparently there was lots of missing time. But uh, more about that later. I thought it would be just a case of getting the second half of the video, going through it, running a few uh, sort of segments out of it, and then making a commentary. But it turned out to be particularly difficult. Um, those of you who did see the uh, the first video uh, will know about this pair of intellectual heavyweights. Um, Mr. Steiger especially hasn't even the slightest idea about what it is he's talking about. Um, he mumbled on about planetary astronomy, displayed a breathtakingly ignorant approach to the subject, uh, whilst showing nothing more than a you know a series of random images that he'd snatched off Google and a, a few sort of CGI videos, and then made a whole load of assumptions about things we have already observed and have extremely accurate models to explain. Um, he obviously doesn't find those things exciting enough, so he simply made up his own explanations which allow him to peddle his I don't know, particular brand of fantasy doom. So, as I said, in part two of this video, um, I thought it would be easy enough, but oh my God, no. He delves even deeper into his personal realm of, fa realm of, uh, of fantasy uh, by displaying images he doesn't understand, referring to, to graphs that he can't interpret, and eventually coming to conclusions that have no basis whatsoever in reality. He is truly a prime example of somebody who thinks they have far more intelligence than they actually do. So, being as it's been a very, very long day, I mean, I think I've spent about six hours going through this video. Um, let's, let's kick things off with this. Let's get into the missing time now. Yes, yeah, so phase two. Um... So I have a second presentation that will begin to make sense of what my hypothesis is of what this missing time element that happened. There it is, straight away, making sense of what my hypothesis is. You know, he's just made something up and now he's trying to find ways of orchestrating little paths back to it. This is known as the Texas Sharp Shooter fallacy, where, you know, imagine somebody with a gun just shoots randomly at a barn door, and then wherever there's the biggest group in, they go and draw a circle around it. That's exactly what this fella's doing. Um, now, I, I must have seen this video in its entirety about 10 times, and I can't find any justification whatsoever for any of the hypotheses that he comes up with. Um, in fact, what we're going to do is just take a look at some of the completely false astronomical observations he makes concerning the cause of the missing time. And remember, he thinks it's a specific astronomical event that has caused this time. Um, this, as I say, supposedly affected a great many people um, back in 2018. Um, spoiler alert, he thinks it's caused by a supernova called TXS 0506 plus 056. Let's have a look. Probably for the first time ever, Rex, what has happened is that we have a nova happening in our quadrant of space. Now, to clear one thing up, there have been many supernovae in our quadrant of the galaxy, and we can see the remnant clouds, which the Hubble telescope has spectacularly revealed to us. However, two of the most recent that were visible to the human eye and observed in real time were SN1607, which I believe was in um, Ophiuchus and was observed and recorded by Johann Kepler. Um, I think that was about 20,000 light years away. The other was slightly earlier was SN1573. So that's what observed 34 years earlier, and that was seen in Cassiopeia by the renowned astronomer Tycho Brahe. Both of these were visible to the naked eye for uh, for weeks during daylight, and there have been at least two more 
in in our galaxy since then um one in in 1680 the other one 1870 um there's no record of them happening at the time um so they were probably too weak but we've certainly detected them since you know with the what with the hubble telescope and what have we anyway onward and this is what they're trying to figure out so we we've never had one we we've recorded them we've seen them i'm going to show uh people quite a few different views of what the different waves are. Here's one from our deep space uh, telescope. That cloud you see is actually an energy wave. Right, so we've never had one, but people have seen and recorded them. Hmm. You're starting to get a sense of the confused nonsense of, of this guy's presentation, right? Anyway, back to TXS 0506 plus 056. From now on, let's just call it TXS, all right? Apparently, it stands for Texas. Um, that's where this thing was discovered. It's right in our neck of the woods. In fact, it's close to Triangulum, the constellation. Now, it's actually nowhere near the Triangulum. Um, take a look up in the night sky, um, a little to the top left of Orion, near Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse whichever you want to call it. And that gives you a fair idea as to where this TXS signal is coming from. Now, before we go further, I should point out that another glaring error in Mr. Steiger's argument is that uh, he keeps referring to TXS as a supernova. TXS is not a supernova. It's, um, it's a high energy blazer, um, which is a, a galactic nucleus with one of its relativistic jets pointing towards the Earth. Um, if the jet was pointing anywhere else, it would simply be called a quasar so how do we know about txs we caught the wave and how we caught this we caught it last year uh 10 miles below the ice we have instruments set up and we caught the first neutrino never have caught that before wrong wrong and wrong it is true that we have neutron detectors under the ice um, they are at the ice cube neutrino detection station in antarctica but the detectors are only 1,500 meters under the ice, not 10 miles. And we have caught neutrinos many times before. The Sudbury neutrino detector in Ontario, in Canada, operated from 1999 to 2006 and was detecting neutrinos at a rate of about 30 per day. Um, that's nothing like the number of neutrinos that come through. Every second of every day, 10 to the 12th number of neutrinos passes through every square centimeter of your body but they have practically no mass, which means that as far as they're concerned, you're not there. In fact, as far as they're concerned, most of the universe isn't there because they just pass right through it. That's why they're so difficult to detect. But if you think Mr. Steiger is talking caca now, wait until you hear this next revelation. Has it gone Nova? It's about only four or five billion miles away. Cosmologically, that's literally next door four or five billion miles away. That's about the same distance as Pluto when we're in opposition to it. Now, an active galactic core pointing straight at us from that distance would completely vaporize the Earth. Um, in fact, Earth would never have existed, not even as a small accreted blob of dirt floating around an early sun. It just would have done it. Um, the actual distance to TXS is around um, 1.75 gigaparsecs, which is about 5.8 billion light years, something like that. Um, that means that when TXS decided to get all, you know, jiggy and started blasting neutrinos out into space, the Earth was still part of an accretion disk orbiting a very, very hot young star. But enough of his wildly inaccurate astronomy. Mr. Steiger seems to think that this Blazar event is responsible for what was going to be the main subject of this video, um, this missing time event that happened on or around the 15th of November 2018. Now, he claims to have experienced this time loss, um, so he made a video about it, and was suddenly bombarded by literally tens of people, all claiming to have witnessed and experienced the same thing. Um, he has this wonderful example. I've had a number of emails, Rex, of people telling me they don't belong in this time dimension. 
I have an email that a woman wrote me and she says, the man that I've been married to for nearly 22 years is not the man that I married. And the kids that are in my house are not my kids. They look like it. She says, everything looks like it, but she says there's something wrong. And I wish I could say that that was the only email I got like that. I think someone took some serious drugs and wandered into the wrong house. You know, <laughs> I can imagine these kids saying to their dad, saying, hey, listen, Pa, I don't know who she is, but she cooks and she cleans. So why don't we keep her? <laughs> you know, um, and what does Mr. Bear have to say about this? Good old Rex Bear with his manly name. So what if with these technologies that put so much energy into these small points, such as these colliders where they're attempting to find these particles and get into different dimensions, what if that has manipulated, like you said, this fabric of time that we are in, and if it's also connected to other quantum strings where there's other beings and there's other people very similar to us, but they're just that one millisecond different, well, that would make the universe different. That would make everything different. So now they're all connecting to this and they're finding ways to tap into it. What if there's universes out there or com complete galaxies that are being, they're in their last, they're dying or they're, they're transforming. I don't want to say dying because they, they will be reborn into something else, but the people that are living in that, they need to go somewhere else. Otherwise, they're going to have to transform them. They don't want to. They think they're dying. So they're like, oh, man, there's this place called Earth. We got to get in there. And they've just got these completely different levels of energies and, and um, technologies. What if they're so far advanced that they could use these quantum computers that are the size of a speck of dust that could then – rewrite your DNA to be the node processing power that they need to become applicable again, to be able to survive, to be able to live and come into this galaxy and into this dimension. You know, you've heard about the, what, are they, what were they called? The Amahatra uh, rites or magical, there was a bunch of rituals that were done by Crowley, Parsons, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. where they were yeah, tapping into these dimensions. Maybe that had something to do with it as well. Now, from, from here on in, the, the stream of consciousness from this R. Wayne Steiger got ever more fractured. And it appears that he is now just sort of, you know, plucking explanations out of thin air. Um, from initially claiming that TXS was the cause of the missing time, he's now changed his mind in, in mid-interview and curls off this absolute gem of a turd. Now, there's a device out there in Area S4 called the Looking Glass Device. Uh, Project Aquarius, you can pull up the documentation on it. It is said that the, the Palladians and those from the Orion system caught this wave, caught this distortion of time, and said that some of them are here working with governments. Um, I don't know. So, in the space of about 20 minutes, he goes from proposing that this mythical time loss was caused by a blazer, um, to the whole thing being manufactured by aliens from the Pleiades and Orion systems, and we know this because of a magic mirror that's being stored in a secret military base in Nevada. Oh, Mr. Steiger, please tell us more. I mean, you know, listen, if, if you believe in angels or demons, that alone proves this theory much more valid because an angel or demon is an interdimensional species coexisting in different realities at different times. You can't just simply, you know, become transparent in this form and still exist and have consciousness of yet that where you came from. And if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. Now, it's at this point that the whole conversation definitely starts to get a bit weird, even for Rex Bay. Um, and you can really see him trying to squirm away from it without actually alienating his own viewer base, uh, who are obviously the sort of people who kind of you know, lap this sort of thing up. Um, <laughs> take a look at him. It's hilarious. I mean, that sounds, you can definitely say that sounds like borderline, I know. So you can almost say delusional. So, delusional, yeah. I mean, not schizophrenic because that's when you're hearing voices. But yeah. um, so, but but still, I mean, at the same time, there definitely could be something there. 
Um, you know, I, I would look at the, I get into some pretty deep conspiracies too, but, um, and definitely in the fringe aspects of things, but I also have the opposite side of the spectrum in my brain that does its best to debunk anything that I, that I research, you know, it's like, okay, let's either debunk it or, or, or verify it. And so that gives you a very small view of the world of our Wayne Steiger and some insight into the sort of content that, um, that Rex Bay runs with uh, on his show. So, to sum up, there are people in this world who think that a galactic core can go supernova, which will alter the flow of time on Earth and cause people to not recognize their husbands, wives, children, except that it wasn't a space beam after all, it was some aliens who were altering time so they can take over the Earth. And we know this because there's a magical mirror in a secret bunker in Nevada. I know this video has been a bit fractured, even on my behalf, but as I say, it was almost impossible to go through and make sense of. One thing we can draw from it is this is the danger of people who present themselves f from a position of authority, even from a position of academia. You know, they sit in front of the camera, they speak with great authority, um, no doubt because they genuinely believe what they're saying, but there are people in this world who perhaps don't think too much for themselves. They think it's far easier to look on YouTube to find a video that suits their particular mindset and they will just assimilate that mindset. There are people who believe this. It's the same as Flat Earth. You know, we all know Flat Earth is nonsense. We all know that there are a hundred thousand observations that prove the Earth is a sphere, but there are still some people who are adamant that it's flat. We know full well that man got to the moon. There are people who say we didn't. We know what the moon's made of. We've got a very, very good idea how it was created. You know, we've got the, um, the Thayer event theory that suits very nicely every mathematical model that's built around it. But there are still people who say, no, the earth was created by humans from the future who came back in time to build the moon because if they hadn't built the moon, life would never have evolved on Earth. Which kind of prompts the question that if they had to come back and build the moon, then there wasn't a moon there in the first place, which means they wouldn't have existed to come back. As I say, a lot of people don't think for themselves. Anyway, thank you for once again putting up with my inane rantings. I'm sorry that the presentation and production value of this video is not particularly good, but... Um, at least I'm trying to get a point across. Anyway, if you're subscribed, thank you very much. I do very much appreciate each and every subscription that uh, that this channel gets. If you're not subscribed, be, please do consider clicking the uh, little Thor down here. Give him a click or wait until Big Thor comes up over here or up here or down here. And uh, please do, please do subscribe. Click the bell notification. YouTube will send you an email on my behalf letting you know when my next dose of inane ranting drops onto YouTube. So, until next time, thank you for watching. Be nice to each other. Heul